What's up everybody? Scott Shetler here at Extreme Performance Training Systems. Welcome to this week's episode of Strength and Health TV. This week I want to talk about the topic of missed lifts. Uh, this was recommended to me by one of the power lifters that I coach, a guy named Doug, who's actually a really good lifter. He's approached some really big numbers. And uh, one of the things, you know, in his training, as he's uh, missed a couple of big lifts here and there, you know, he, he suggested that in some of the because of some of the dialogue that he and I've had as a result of that, he suggested that this might be a good topic. And I, I think it's a really great topic because it's something that I see in the gym on a somewhat regular basis. And I know it's also been the topic of a lot of uh, different debates and things like that. You know, uh, when you start talking about some of the factors like the psychological aspects of lifting and things like that as well. So uh, I think it's a good topic to get into. And uh, speaking of the psychology of lift, I kind of wanted to go ahead and start there. Uh, there's really two types of lifters that I've noticed, you know, there's people that can miss a lift and just kind of shake it off and, and not really think anything of it, you know, they miss a lift in training, whatever, you know, they, they're going for a big lift and uh, it, it doesn't bother them. Then there's some people who miss a lift and it's just like their world just, just collapsed. Uh, they kind of were, were basing everything off that one lift and then when, when they don't make that, that small PR or, or worse yet if it's a, a high percentage of a max that they've done before, it can just psychologically destroy them. And I, I think, you know, it really depends on what your personality type is and how you respond to that. Personally, I don't think it's healthy uh, to get too into your head, particularly when you're training. Uh, you know, and, and the topic, you know, th this is really more uh, geared toward people who compete in strength sports. Uh, and even competitive athletics, uh, when we start talking about this type of psychology training, if you're just training for fitness, it's not that big of a deal. And if it is, uh, you got issues. <laughs> but, you know, when we're talking about how this, this relates to maybe the competitive lifter or the competitive athlete, psychologically missing a lift, particularly in training, can be uh, pretty damaging for some people. Uh, so I think it's really important to try to set yourself up for success in your training program and try to minimize the number of missed lifts. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, you, you can uh, consider when we're talking about the psychology of the, the sport or, or the training is, is that you don't want to make, and, and personally I feel that this is the best approach, but you don't want to make uh, training like a meet. You know, oftentimes when we talk about our, our maxes, we talk about a training max and we talk about a competition max. You know, when we're talking about competitive lifting, you're lifting on a much more heightened state of arousal. You know, you've got just more naturally, your adrenaline's higher, you're a little bit more amped up, you might do some things to psych up at a competition, but it's also very uh, physiologically stressful on the body and it's very, very draining. If you've ever done a powerlifting meet and really push yourself to the limit on the three classical lifts, then you know that when you're doing, you know, that, that much in one, one day, or half a day, depending on how long the meet is, that can be really, really physically stressful on the body. So you don't want to make your training like a meet. Uh, you know, you might see some people at the gym, they get really amped up, you know, they snort ammonia, they kick, they kick the deadlift bar, you know, they stomp around, they grunt, they groan. You know, we see it all with the deadlifts on Instagram where people have these ridiculous setups where they sprint toward the bar and they're flailing their arms around and stuff like that. And it's like, it's a training lift. It's like, you know, it might be 85% of the one rep max or something like that, and it's just kind of ridiculous. I think you should keep your, uh, personally, I, I think it's best to keep your, your physiological stress as low as, po as possible in training, which is one of the benefits that I really find. You know, we, we here in my training center and the lifters that I work with, uh, like Doug, uh, we follow what I guess you would call the West Side method uh, or the conjugate method where we have a maximal effort day for the upper and lower body once a week. So every week we're maxing out on some sort of bench press variation or a squat deadlift or good morning variation. So we're pushing it pretty hard on a weekly basis, which is another reason that I think it's important. You know, we're basing all these lifts off of lifts that we do in training not in competition. Because on the max effort day, we never do the classical lift or, or the parent lift. We never do a regular free squat, a bench press, or a uh, deadlift off the ground. We're always gonna do some sort of variation. It might be a low box squat. It might be a box, box squat with a specialty barbell like the safety squat bar. Uh, it might be you know, a board press or a floor press or a deadlift with the weight sitting on blocks, or a deficit deadlift where you're standing on blocks, or a variation of a rack pull, or something like that. We're always going to rotate to a different exercise every week and establish records in those lifts so that when those exercises, when those lifts come back in our rotation, we're going to try to break those. We're going to try to establish a very small five-pound PR 
and then get out of there. And we're going to try to break those PRs all the time. And if you do this properly, you should set a new PR almost every time you train. Now, there are certain days where maybe you're just a little bit run down. You know, maybe you just don't have it in you that day. But as long as, and we're going to talk about how we structure our training for the days that we miss those lifts here at my gym. And I know it's, it's probably different than, you know, I, I know it's probably different than what they do at Westside. I've only been out there a couple of times. I've talked to Louie a handful of times and I've read all this stuff. So in no way, shape, or form am I, you know, trying to say or, or, or trying to portray what they do up there. What I'm saying is I've studied this material for many years now. I've visited and trained there. I've talked to Louie on a regular basis and some of the lifters up there. So what I do in my gym is my interpretation of that information as well as the things that I've got to adjust with my lifters on a daily basis. So while what we do is very much inspired by the West Side method, this is certainly not West Side training. I think that that happens up you know, at that gym in Columbus, Ohio. So I'm in no way, shape, or form trying to portray this as West Side. So I just want to clear that up right away before people start saying, well, you know, that, that's not West Side or, you know, whatever. It, no, it's well, what I do is inspired by that. And I think uh, Louis is a brilliant guy and he's a mentor of mine. Uh, so what I'm talking about is the things that I do with my lifters. So again, we have that, that weekly max that we're trying to break on the max effort day, a variation of the squat bench. Uh, deadlift or sometimes we work good mornings and on the lower lower body days um, Basically what we do is I try to keep my lifters. I try to get them to keep their physiological stress really low uh, I do have a couple lifters that sometimes they will snort ammonia if they're going for a PR attempt I've got some lifters who need to do the same thing You know that they, they need to do their meat psych up just like they you know do, or their training psych up just like they do in the meat personally I'm against that, but I will always defer to the lifter. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. If that's what they need to do to hit that PR, that's fine. Uh, I just think it's very stressful on the adrenal glands. I think it's very stressful on the, the nervous system. And I want to get as much out of my training uh, without getting myself that jacked up because I'm trying to break PRs on a weekly basis. So I just think it's best to stay, you know, there's nothing wrong with getting a little amped up, but, you know, to go through a full competition psych up, you know, to snort ammonia, to beat your head into the wall or whatever you got to do, to do that every day, you know, you know, twice a week is just, in my opinion, it's just a little bit too stressful on the body and may tap into your, your body's recovery abilities. So I like to base everything off that training max and every time a lift that we're working on the max effort day finds its way back into rotation, we're just trying to break that. Uh, with we're, we're going with three lifts that day that count. We're going to take 90% of that lift, we're going to take 95% of that lift, and then we're going to try to get a small PR, maybe a 5 or a 10 pound PR, usually a 5 pound PR, then we're going to call it a day. Now on a rare occasion, if it's a lift maybe we haven't done it in a while, and that 5 pound PR, if you just totally smoke it and you know you've got a lot more in you, like 20 pounds or more, then we may put another 10, 20 pounds on the bar, take another PR, and then shut it down after that. There's no point, you know, it's a, I think it's important to save, save a little bit, not run yourself into the ground on that session, you know, leave a little bit so that you can come back and continue to break PRs. You know, I call it playing the long game. You know, we want to do this uh, for a while. We don't want to burn out really fast. So I look at small, steady gains over time, consistent gains over time. And I think when you approach it like that, you can regularly break your PR in those in those uh, exercises that make their way into the max effort rotation on a fairly regular basis. Now there are days where sometimes no matter what, you know, maybe you've lost weight, maybe you've dropped down a weight class, uh, you know, maybe your nutrition's been bad or your sleep's been bad or whatever. Maybe you know on a max effort day you just don't have it. Uh, what I look at is did we make that 90% and that 95% lift? Usually people miss on the PR attempt. I very rarely see people miss on the 90 or the 95% attempt, which to me, that says we're maintaining really good strength. If we're at 90% or better every week, you know, all, all year long, then we're doing really, really well. So as long as we're hitting 90, 95%, if we miss that PR attempt, big deal. Usually what I have my lifters do is we'll cut the weight back down. So, so say we made the 90%, we made the 95, we missed the PR. We'll take a minute, we'll drop the weight back down to somewhere between 90 and 95%, and we're going to get a couple, you know, two to five more singles at that weight. And the reason for two to five more singles is if you, if you base this off Prilipin's chart, like Louis Simmons recommends, A.S. Prilipin was a weightlifting coach out of the Soviet Union, who, uh, he's, uh, when you talk about Prilipin's chart or Prilipin's table, he, uh, 
I think it was in Managing the Training of the Weightlifter uh, was the book that this was published in, but there's a chart that shows various percentages and then the optimal number of lifts, the optimal number of reps per set, and then the ranges uh, for various percentages, 60, 70, 80, and 90% or greater. So if you look at Prilipin's chart, at when you're lifting at 90% or greater, what he recommends is a range of 4 to 10 reps, 7 being optimal. So typically we're going to do 3 reps at 90% or greater in the max effort workout. And if we break the PR, we're generally gonna shut it down there and on a good note, and then move on to the accessory exercises. Now, if we don't break that PR, typically what I'll do, like I said a minute ago, I'm gonna have my lifters reduce the weight back down to that 90 to 95% range, and we're gonna do two to five more singles. And that ends up being four to seven lifts. Now, typically we're gonna end up right around four or five lifts before they start feeling it. Uh, power lifts are a little bit more, they're, they're, they're slow strength, you know, when you're talking about maximal effort lifts, it's more of a grinding strength. It's not like you're doing a snatch or a clean and jerk, which is still a very explosive lift. It's a fast lift. You know, the power lifts are not like that. I think they can be a little bit more physically taxing from the grind, you know, that you typically encounter during a max effort deadlift, squat, or bench. So a lot of times we're going to end up, you know, cashing in right around four or five reps versus pushing it all the way up to seven. But you know, if the bar speed's good and they're making the lifts, you know, we might take it all the way up to seven total reps at 90% or greater. And that's how we get around a missed max effort attempt. Uh, you know, in, in that case, like I said, if you're missing that PR, you're missing that, that PR attempt, or you're missing that 95% lift, that's the best way to do it. Stay right there about 90% or a little over 90% and hit those numbers and get some good lifts with a heavy, you know, with a maximal effort or a near maximal effort weight uh, so that you're con conditioning your nervous system, you're conditioning, you know, the inter and intramuscular coordination, and you're driving all the benefits that come with the max effort method. Now, uh, you know, a lot of times people will tell me that it wasn't the weight, it was their technique. Their technique got me, oh, my technique's not good enough. And I think that's a bunch of bullshit, personally. You know, you listen to so many people that champion these programs where all you're supposed to do is squat, bench, and deadlift in the classical manner. You know, no variations or very limited variations. There's no reason to do rack pulls or block pulls or deficit deadlifts. There's no reason to do box squats or Anderson squats or, or partials or, or excessive range of motion lifts. You know, there's no reason to do board presses. You know, it's all a bunch of junk, right? All you got to do is the classical lifts. And by building te technical perfection of those lifts, you're going to get stronger. Well, the problem is that might work up to about 80, 85 percent. But once you start nearing 90% or greater, your technique's going to start breaking down. All right, your form's going to break down a little bit. If you watch somebody pull a max effort deadlift uh, or they're trying to break a PR versus pulling 80% or 85%, that lift is going to look a lot different. You're probably not going to see their back break down and their form's going to be much better at a lighter weight. So when somebody tells me that, you know, I missed a 90% or greater lift or a max effort attempt because my technique was shitty, well, you don't need better technique. If you can bench 135 with perfect technique, you know how to do the lift correctly. That, that's why, you know, these people that just say you just got to do the lift over and over and over. How many times do you got to do it right, you know, before you get it? You know how to bench press, you know how to squat, you know how to deadlift. This isn't rocket science. You don't need to, to worry about technique every single time. And I'm not saying that you don't focus on good technique when you're lifting heavy weights, but once you know how to do, do the lift, you really can only do it wrong after that point, right? I mean, I mean, you're not you're not going to learn it any better or any righter. I mean, these are basic movements. We're talking about elbow and shoulder flexion and extension. We're talking about hip and knee extension and flexion. I mean, this is not this is not you know astrophysics, man. I mean, this is just squatting, benching, and deadlifting. So when people say, "Oh, I missed that weight because my technique was bad," yeah, okay, maybe, but chances are, if you got out of the groove, it wasn't because you don't know how to do the bench press. It's because you got a weak muscle group that failed during the lift. All right. So if you're failing at the lockout on the bench press, it's because your triceps aren't strong enough to lock out the weight, not because your technique sucks. So build stronger triceps, and if you just bench over and over and over, that's always going to be your weak point until you start targeting the triceps with some overload work, with some partial presses, with some dumbbell extensions, with some push downs, with some you know, high rep accessory work to build up the strength endurance in the triceps and condition them. Maybe you need a little bit of muscle mass. I mean, there's so many things 
that you can do to build up the triceps to contribute to the lockout without just benching over and over and over and trying to perfect technique. At some point, you got to lift heavy weights. And if your technique's good up to 80, 85%, that's great. What happens when you get over 90%? It's not a technique issue, it's a weak muscle issue. So you've got to look at where your lift's breaking down. Is the bar getting out of the groove? You come down, you go to press, does it go forward? Does it go back over your face? Are you losing? Are, are you having a bad bar path? Is your bar path not straight? Well, chances are you're not using your lats properly in the bench press. So you might need more lat work and practice on your setup. So it might not have anything to do with your actual bench stroke. It's got something to do with your lats acting as stabilizers of the shoulders and kind of a launching pad for the, uh, for the bench press. So if you're out of the groove, it could be your lats. Not that your technique sucks. If you can't lock it out, it might be the triceps. You know, maybe you need some speed work. You know, you're not just fast pressing, so you, you got to do some dynamic work. Maybe some med ball throws, maybe some explosive push-ups, maybe some speed work, you know, with, with bands or chains or bands and chains attached to the bar. I mean, there's so many things that you can do to build these weak points and these sticking points in your lift. If you don't take advantage of it, well, you're, you're a moron. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's <laughs> no better way to say it. You know, you really need to be able to break down your lifts and see where they're, where they're breaking or where they're falling apart and then address those issues. And it's usually a weak muscle group. I mean, if you're, if you're competing in powerlifting, chances are you know how to squat, bench, and deadlift pretty damn well. I'm guessing your technique, you know, if you put 135 on the bar, you're probably going to show me excellent technique. You know, show me what your technique is over 90%. What we're going to see is weak muscle groups that need to be strengthened. So that's when you have to really focus on the accessory work and you have to use your max effort exercises as testers and then, then be able to apply the right builders based on the analysis of that test. So, uh, you know, I, I just, I don't buy that technique bullshit. You know, I just think it's, uh, you know, people that like to bash maybe the conjugate method or maybe they don't like Louis or the, the West Side method, but, you know, he's, he's just taking the scientific principles of training and applying them to powerlifting and other sports. I mean, he didn't, he didn't come up with this stuff. It's just he organized it in a different manner based on what he learned from the various Soviet texts and the Bulgarians and, and the other coaches that he studied the material of when he was trying to find a better way to train when his typical linear periodization wasn't working for him. So, you know, if you don't take advantage of all these different tools in your toolbox and if you don't have a big toolbox, you know, when you, when you break down, where are you going to go? So I think it's really important that you not just focus on technique. I mean, technique is important, but you've got to be able to identify where you're breaking down and why you miss that lift. Is it just because you are tired and run down? Or, you know, if you're feeling really good and your nutrition's good, you've got good rest and you feel pretty optimal and you go in and you miss that lift, where did you miss? You know, did you miss near the lockout on the bench press? Was it a few inches off the chest? Was your bar path bad in the squat? Are your hips shooting forward? Are your knees shooting forward? Are you, are you buckling over with the bar? Are you not engaging your abs? Are your, is your lower back not strong enough? Is your upper back not strong enough? You've got to be able to look at the squat, at the deadlift, at the bench, at those variations of those lifts that you're implementing on your max effort day. Or in, in a contest, when you do the classical lifts, you got to look and see you know, where you missed that weight in the contest, and you've got to look at where it broke down. That's why you need a good coach with some good eyes on you, or at least to video everything that you do and analyze those videos so you can see where you're breaking down so you know what to fix. If you're not constantly analyzing and, and evaluating the work that you're doing in the gym, you're never going to get better. You're only going to get up to a certain point. But once it starts getting hard to make progress, you know, we always make big jumps early on when we're just learning, you know, neural efficiency, when we're just, you know, when we are building our technique and we're, and we're in technique is making big jumps and things like that it is allowing us to make big jumps in the weights. But once we get technique in check, once we've built some muscle mass, once we've got some strength, you know, once you've got a couple years of training under your belt, the jumps get smaller and smaller. And you really have to be able to evaluate what you're doing, see where you're breaking down, and know how to fix that if you want to get stronger to continue to get stronger and better. So that's, you know, that, that's my take on this whole missed lift thing. Uh, and, you know, when we talk about the psychology of it, nothing is ever worth going, you know, going to a dark place and beating yourself up and, you know, you know learn from it. You know, if you never miss a lift in training, you, you're never going to have anything to work on. You know, training is about fixing things. It's about getting stronger. So those misses, take them as lessons. You know, those misses are an indicator of what you need to work on to improve. So take it in stride. 
you know, I think one of the best things that you can do is if you do miss a lift in training, if you do miss that, you know, maximal effort attempt or that near max attempt, go ahead and cut back down to 90% and hit some more singles. You know, uh, one book that I like to reference quite a bit is The Forgotten Secrets of the uh, Culver City Westside Barbell Club. It's a collection of articles about the original Westside Barbell Club from Culver City, California. One of the things that I noticed a lot in their, uh, and, and they weren't just doing the classical lifts over and over, they were big on the box squat, low box squat, high box squat. They were big on block pulls and partial deadlifts. They were big on variations of the bench press, tricep work, you know, things like that. You know, they did a lot of, lot of work out of the rack, pin presses from different heights, you know, flat, incline, you know, things like that. They were always using variations of this, and this was back in the, the 70s or whatever. I mean, these guys were way ahead of their time when you read about what they were doing. One of the things that I noticed is they liked to do a lot of heavy singles. Now, they weren't necessarily following Prilipin's advice, and I don't know if they had even heard about it, but one of the things that I noticed is they like to do a lot. You, you see a lot of these programs that they used to write about in the various publications back in the day that are reprinted in this book. You see them recommending, you know, five singles, six singles, seven singles, and I'm willing to bet that if they're training intuitively, those weights are going to be somewhere in that ballpark of about 85 to 90 or maybe 95%. So it's probably going to be right in line or pretty close to uh, what the rec recommendations are for optimal rep ranges four percentages of your uh, one rep max based on you know what Prilipin presents. So there's nothing wrong with getting down and doing some work at 90%, doing a bunch of singles. You know, powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting, these sports are about your one rep max, you know, lifting one time. You don't go to a contest and do a triple. You don't go to a contest and do a double or a set of five. And I'm not saying, you know, sets of doubles, triples, and five shouldn't be in your training. I like them for a lot of supplementary exercises that we do. But uh, you, at some point in time, you've got to lift heavy single reps. And I think there's a lot to be gained by if you miss a lift, backing down 90, 90%, per, 90 and hitting a few more singles. Some of my lifters here like to call it their punishment sets, you know, whatever you want to call it. But uh, that, that builds a uh, fantastic technique with a heavy weight, you know, because now you're lifting at, at a near maximal load and, it, and, and you're gaining the benefits of the maximal effort method. You know, if you read Zatsiorski's work, he talks about the importance of the, the neural effect of the uh, uh, maximal effort method in building that inter and intramuscular coordination. So that's my take on missed lifts. Uh, don't let it eat you alive. Just uh, learn from it. Back down and hit those singles and then get back in the gym the next day and, and, and get on to the next workout. And then when you come back to that lift, chances are you're going to be a lot stronger because you know where you're breaking down and what you need to affix, what you need to fix through your uh, supplementary and accessory work. So thanks, Doug, for the uh, topic recommendation. Hopefully uh, you got a lot out of it and hopefully uh, the rest of you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you've got any questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below. As always, if you've got any suggestions for future episodes, for topics for future episodes, leave those in the comment section below. And as always, stay strong, stay healthy. Till next time, we'll check you later.